Welcome to Manufacturing Talks with Jim Vinosky. Industry has a million cool stories, and Jim talks to the movers and shakers who are making them happen. Let's dive in. Welcome back to Manufacturing Talks. I'm Jim Vinosky, and we are sponsored by Cosgrove Content, your wordsmiths for industry. If you are in manufacturing and you struggle to find someone to write in a way that people can understand about what you do, get a hold of Cosgrove Content at cosgrovecontent.com. And it is a, a great pleasure to have my guest today, Nikki Gonzalez. She is the head of partnerships at Quote Beam, and she is also co-host of her own podcast at Automation Ladies. Welcome, Nikki. Hey, Jim. Thanks for having me. Oh, thanks for being on. How are you doing today? Pretty good. We had a big thunderstorm in Houston last night, and it's been raining most of the morning. My internet's been in and out, but it looks like uh, we are done with the rain, at least for now. So Good. Yeah, I saw that on LinkedIn that you were out of power <laughs> for a while. Yeah, my internet was, I was like falling in and out of meetings earlier. Uh, I had a team meeting with my team on on Google Hangouts, and I think I dropped out like four times. So wow. if I drop out of this recording, you'll know why, but it seems like my <laughs> internet's been stable for the last hour at least. Well, we'll keep our fingers crossed and see if we can get through this. Um, so first of all, welcome to the wall of metal. We didn't even talk about this up front. Um, this is kind of my theme for cool. my show, and that is that mix of, so I'm an old school heavy metal headbanger. So you see my favorite bands all around. And then my buddy, Corey Bonnet, did these prints, paintings that he's done of the uh, steel industry down there in Pittsburgh. And oh, he's cool. got a great show. He's gonna be, actually be up here in Grand Rapids with his artwork for our art prize here in not too long. But we're here to talk about you and you've got so much going on. Uh, like we were talking about up front, you and I share this insanity of going after way too much in way too short a time. And I want to hear all about it. Yeah, I, uh, oh gosh. So I am uh, <laughs> currently head of partnerships at QuoteBeam, as you mentioned. We are yep. a startup marketplace for industrial automation components. We're trying to solve some of these supply chain issues that we have by connecting the community of, of distributors um, and sources of automation hardware and uh, bringing it a little bit into 2022 by um, bringing workflow automation and online shopping to, to the industry to make it easier. Um, and that's something that I'm kind of knee deep in every day. We're at a stage right now where we're really growing fast, but we don't have everything and everyone on our platform. So I'm doing a lot of stuff that's not quite scalable um, in order to really understand my customers' pain points, everybody out there in the community, do what I can to help while we're building the tech infrastructure. So it actually, uh, one of the stories I like that really makes me think that I'm doing the right thing is, um, when Airbnb was early on, you know, it was a new concept, right? People listing their houses or their, you know, couch or their rooms or whatever. And yeah. the hosts didn't really know what they're doing. The users didn't know what they're doing. It was new, right? And they were not getting a lot of booking. So the founders went out and actually went and took a, a camera and hired a photographer and went to all the listings in San Francisco and took photos for the hosts and like oh, wow. they arranged their pillows and all this stuff. <laughs> and yeah. Sometimes, you know, that's just what you got to do to to get things rolling and, and solve the problems while you're building the infrastructure to do it all, you know, automatically or whatever. So I've been sourcing components for all of our automation community. Anybody that reaches out to us, whether it's users from our, you know, website or people that we know from the industry um, on LinkedIn, I've developed a really great network and I've just learned a ton in the process about what's going on with our supply chains. Like you said, I'm one of those people that, you know, can't stick to a lane. I'm always mm -hmm. looking at learning what's going on upstream and downstream. So I've been getting a lot into even the chip supply chain, understanding what's going on there, how that's changing, what's going on, how we can source for the manufacturers that are trying to build PLCs and all these things yep, that we can't yep. deliver on the automation side. And then also on, you know, there's so much going on in robotics and uh, just automation building in general because we're wanting to reshore a lot of this manufacturing and, you know, we need automation with the labor shortages. Um, it's such a complex, but wonderful mess to be in the middle of right now, mm -hmm. uh, that it is very exciting. Um, and I'm having a lot of fun with it. And then, uh, you know, along with that, uh, like you said, I'm kind of a crazy person that tries to do too many things at once because I'm just perpetually curious and, and I have this passion to, to do things 
Um, I started the show Automation Ladies with uh, Ali G, who's a, a systems integrator and um, controls engineer. She's out of Seattle. And we just really, we found each other on LinkedIn and we connected yep. really well. And, you know, we complement each other really well and we do different parts of the industry. Um, and we just really felt like there was a little bit of a lack of content of people like us in the industry. We, you know, we desperately need more people to come into automation and into mm -hmm. manufacturing. Yep. And one of the ways to do that is to try to increase the representation because when people see people like themselves, they feel more comfortable that it's an opportunity. And we found almost everybody that we talked to, we asked them, how did you get into automation? Usually it's some sort of accident or, yeah. you know, I didn't know that I was going to get into it, but a, you know, a family member or a professor or, you know, some crooked path to get there. Yeah, yeah. And we want it to become one of those, you know, when kids say, what do you want to grow up? What do you want to do when you grow up? They're like, oh, doctor, firefighter, the, all these jobs that they see out in the world, they don't see the manufacturing jobs. Mm -hmm. um, and we just wanted to add another voice to the, to the discourse and discussion in the community that, hey, whether you're a girl or a boy or, a, you know, old person, young person, it doesn't matter. There are tons of different opportunities in the automation world for you. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and, that's well, kind of and, with that. and, and you made a great point about, you know, people being comfortable seeing someone like them in the place they might be aiming at. But the other thing, too, that I see with what I watch you doing out there is, um, you know, you're spreading a message to a group that otherwise might not get it or groups. Um, you and Andrew Crow and folks like that um, who are out there evangelizing for manufacturing do the market doing the marketing that we've been so bad at for so long and it's just phenomenal well, we've been very good at marketing to ourselves <laughs> yeah right you know to the people that already care and already yes. know. preaching to the choir yeah exactly not taking it to the new group so that's cool um before we dive into you touched on so many points that we're going to hit um but before we dive into that you know i'm convinced that part of why you have this uh kind of franticness to you is your background so first of all, I learned quite by happenstance by seeing your maiden name on LinkedIn that you're from Iceland. So yeah. we got to talk about that. So I moved, uh, yeah, I grew up in, in Akureyri, which is a small town north of Iceland. Um, and my dad is an electrical engineer. And ah, okay. he started uh, when I was little, his first job out of college um, I'll date myself and my dad here, if you if you don't mind, in the audience. But sure. in 1987, my dad got his electrical engineering degree, and he wrote a thesis on an artificially intelligent robot that poured. I, in my memory, it was wine because my dad likes to drink wine. But apparently, it <laughs> water it poured water. It poured like water into a cup, you know. Uh -huh. Yeah. And he he's he's a brilliant uh, controls engineer, and he started. Uh, He's always been, he's an entrepreneur too. So before he even got his electrical engineering degree, he had a business going around the countryside, selling fish to farmers. Um, and he uh, would build computers in his spare time. He used to flip old rusty cars. Nice. Uh, so just always, you know, he never had a problem making money because he always just, there were different opportunities, mm -hmm. right? My grandfather uh, ran a nursery in his backyard uh, as a side business. And anytime my dad needed extra money for the weekend, he would go shovel dirt into bags for my grandfather's nursery and to have enough to, you know, go buy drinks on the weekend. So <laughs> I just kind of picked that up from my dad, I guess. Yep. Um, I have a sister who is five years younger than me. She grew up in the same environment. She's not mm -hmm. entrepreneurial at all. She's not a people person. Like just, it, it, it is interesting. We grew up with that exact same sort of environment and, you know, different personalities are different as well. So I somehow yep. got that entrepreneurial craziness from my dad, as well as my little bit of an engineering sort of way to think solving problems. But yeah, so I grew up in the small town of Iceland, idyllic, you know, childhood, small place, you didn't have to lock your door, you could go run mm -hmm. around with your friends outside. Um, and my dad started working a, a, on different like telecom applications. And he worked for uh, this company that made jigging reels for fishing boats mm -hmm. and he started getting involved with like international bodies uh, in the uh european i guess it wasn't the european union at the time but in yeah. europe about fisheries technologies and things like that and he ended up uh working with a british company that then wanted to hire him and so there kind of began our 
adventure of uh, yes, being outside yeah. of Iceland. And yep. my dad wanted to move to the US. And so this company had a branch in the US, but they wanted him over in the UK first for a little while. So we moved to the UK when I was 11. And we were there for almost a year. And then we moved to Houston, Texas after that. And uh, I'll be honest, it was a huge culture shock for me. Oh, I bet. Uh, because yeah. in Europe, I was, you know, as a kid, you just have a lot more sort of freedom. Um, I was able to, in Iceland, you know, take the bus by myself when I was eight. In England, I was taking the train and going places. And then I moved to Houston, Texas, and I couldn't go anywhere without my mom driving me in a car. Yeah, uh, yeah. And it, I, I didn't love it at first. Uh, I was actually pretty depressed about it for a couple of years. I tried my hardest to get my parents to, to move back. Um, when I realized that wasn't happening because my dad's business, uh, he, there actually, they shut down the, the branch of the company that he worked for, mm. but he started his own business because, you know, his uh. adventure was not over. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> <laughs> so instead I, at some point realized it was up to me yeah. to make the best of this or not. And so I flipped my attitude around and I started to try to just you know, learn how to enjoy it here. And at the same time, started working for my dad in his startup business. Um, and that's kind of where I got the bug to of just working in a way where, uh, you know, everything needs to be done. There's not enough people around to do it. So you just go and do your best and try things out and figure it out. Um, and I really credit him with a, a lot of the success I've had in my career because he always stood behind me and just told me you can do whatever you want. Um, and he gave me the opportunities to do all kinds of stuff. I interned for him every summer, all the way throughout college. Um, but I think I've been told from some people that, you know, they know, um, more people from Scandinavia and that it's some sort of Scandinavian work ethic. I wouldn't say that everybody over there is like this. It may or may not be true, but, uh, I really, you know, I, I didn't appreciate Iceland until I moved away from there. I used mm -hmm. to feel like it was really small, limited opportunities, you know, which yeah. it is. But at the same yeah. time, having moved into a couple of other places in the world, it's it's one of the best places in the world. My yeah. mom lives there now. Um, and because of COVID, we haven't been able to travel much lately. Mm -hmm. But it's it's an amazing place. And I, yeah. I am lucky to call it home. In addition to now my second home, I'm also a U.S. citizen now. And we're glad to have you. Um <laughs> I'm no international traveler, but I had the opportunity to visit Iceland um, 13, 14 years ago. And um, it was a whirlwind tour, but I did get uh, to a few different spots, not just Reykjavik, but I uh, went and visited what, what we here call the geyser, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, and what's the big waterfall not too far from Reykjavik? Um, oh, shoot. It, I've forgotten the name. Dettifoss or... Yes, uh, that's the one. Yeah. Yep. yeah. Um, and then um, worked both in the city on the business side of what I was doing. But then I was also there. I was there learning how to make Icelandic skier. I was with oh, Yoko yeah. at the time. Well, and yeah, you know, you know Sikkis, right? They they started up here in the U.S. and yeah. just yep. killing it. It's so cool that like when I first moved here in 2000, Nobody heard of Iceland aside from like Bjork and the Mighty Ducks. <laughs> right. I, I think I even posted about that the other day. It was funny that I thought of it, but nothing Icelandic. Anybody knew, you know, now I can go to Whole Foods or even H -E my local HEB. I can get Icelandic skid, even at Trader Joe's. I can get Icelandic lamb at Whole Foods. I can get Icelandic chocolates. I can yeah. get Icelandic fish. It's fantastic. This whole Well, it was a wonderful place Wonder to Bowl. visit. A uh, beautiful country. A little forbidding. I was there in November, so even more forbidding. <laughs> oh, yeah. Not the best time for weather. No, no. In short days. But it was still a marvelous visit, and the people there were absolutely wonderful. So I understand if, why you're happy to call that if, home. If you don't mind me digressing a little bit. No, um, go I'm, ahead. I'm not the most succinct person in the world. <laughs> it's okay. All the time. I actually come from the dairy industry in Iceland. My family, um, my grandfather was a dairy engineer. He was in charge of making the butter. He went and studied in Germany um, and learned all about the processing of dairy and the equipment and all of that stuff. He, he ran that department his entire career. Um, and my parents both met, they met working summer jobs at the dairy. Really? Yes. Wow. And now one of my cousins is a uh, metal worker. I, I don't know what it's called exactly. He works with steel mostly, um, but he runs the uh, maintenance department at the dairy. 
<laughs> Perfect. So see, we've got all kinds of things in common. Yeah, That's it's a cool. small world. <laughs> now, not content with moving halfway around the world, then you also moved all over the U.S. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Again, couldn't help myself. I mean, I have to say, I didn't, I didn't love Texas, right? I decided to make the best of it, but I also decided as soon as I can, I'm going to get the heck out of there. Uh, so, well, okay, I was in high school. I was thinking about moving back to Iceland for college uh, or going to Europe, but timing was not so great. Um, when I graduated, things were starting to look a little bit um, crazy with the economy in Iceland and things like that. So my, oh, my yeah. parents were like, oh, you know, why don't you go to college here? So I ended up going to UT in Austin because being mm -hmm. an international student, I didn't know this, but you can't really go to any of the fancy private colleges unless you have money because they literally want you to show them that you can afford two semesters worth of tuition in your bank account before you can mm -hmm. even apply, uh, which was not the case for me. So thankfully, <laughs> Houston, uh, Texas had a law on the books that allows uh, residents that have graduated from a Texas high school to get in-state tuition at in-state colleges. Oh, nice. So I didn't even visit anywhere else. I just was like, UT, it's the, that's where I'm going. I'm going to Austin. I loved it. Um, and then as soon as I was done with that, I wanted to move out of the state. And I got really lucky. I, I worked, I had no idea about the industrial automation industry. So my, my dad being an engineer, um, I knew, you know, about that sort of stuff. I worked with him selling or not selling. I was interning. I ended up making a sale just because I happened to be the one that picked up the phone and followed through the whole process. Um, cool. We were doing tracking and communications for fleets of trucks using mm -hmm. satellite and cellular technology um, at yep. the time because the cell networks were not so great covering like rural areas and things like that. We had to use satellites to back that up. Yep. Um, and this was like kind of early on in that industry, but I did not really know about the manufacturing of anything um, being in production plants. Like I knew about the dairy, but that, that was about it. And, but I went to business school because I saw my dad as kind of this entrepreneur CEO Um I got an international business degree and which is one of the business degrees that doesn't really have a shoe in starter position. <laughs> so like, what do you do with that? Yeah. I don't know. So I yep. applied for technical marketing, technical recruiting, technical sales positions. And I got lucky and I ended up with this company called Keyance that hires a lot of people out of college and trains the heck out of them on the technologies that they sell. Nice. And so they sent me to Chicago I trained on sensors and vision systems and all kinds of stuff. And cool. I went to yep. various offices around the country and I ended up getting a position um, in machine vision systems in the San Francisco Bay area. And I, I originally wanted to go to Seattle because I had some friends there. They didn't have any openings. So I was like, well, California is close enough. And little did I know how much of an amazing place I was going to. I had never been there before. Oh, wow. Um, yep. And I got to work in, I, I was, you know, just had a territory. I supported vision systems for every industry from Silicon Valley out to the Valley, they call it, but in yep. Fresno, you know, Modesto, those areas. So I got to see everything from advanced solar cell R&D operations and semiconductor fab manufacturing and semiconductor equipment to, you know, poultry processing and mm -hmm. plastic bottle manufacturing and wineries. And it was an amazing experience to how to like to enter into the industry and yeah. get to get hands on with all these different applications. But that's yeah, really what, what an of, education. Holy yeah, cow. that sparked my interest in everything. And then I ended up moving to Seattle more recently um, for about three years. That's a whole nother story. I probably would take a, a couple of hours <laughs> if I went into the whole thing. But <clears throat> and then I just recently moved back to Texas because now I have two kids. I have a two year old and a four year old. Um, and with the pandemic and everything, it just made a lot more sense for me to be closer to my family. Sure. I have yeah. family here and then family in Iceland. And uh, I realize now as an adult, you know, the, it's not about the place. It's about the people. That's what home is for me. And yeah. I, can, I can really make the best of it here, even though I don't love the weather. I agree with your point about the people. Absolutely. Well, cool. So you touched on how you got this. Uh, amazing education in automation and, and instrumentation. Um, now talk about what you're up to now. Talk yeah, more about yeah. how you're applying that. So I had uh, this wonderful experience in industrial 
automation with machine vision. But being the type of person I am, uh, I was always looking upstream and downstream on the production line because usually I'm doing defect detection um, mm -hmm. or or some you know maybe measuring in line different things like that and then something would have to get kicked off the line if it was bad and you know we were doing it with a uh, a centralized processor so instead of sending the information to a PLC we had the I/O right there on on the controller and so oftentimes I would you know sell the sensors and some of the you know we would work together with the whoever was putting on the system um, to put in pneumatics or something that would then kick out the part yep, or divert it yep. to a different part of the line. And I just got really interested in, in the motion and the other things going on. Um, mm -hmm. and I ended up moving over to Festo and working there with, uh, electromechanical and pneumatic, uh, motion and, and control systems and things like that. And, uh, that's where I met, um, the CEO and co-founder of Copebeam, Roman Peach. He at the time was working as the head of, uh, the West coast customer solutions group which is kind of Festo's internal machine builder. They do a lot of sub-assemblies for other OEMs and things like mm -hmm. that. Yep. And we worked together on some projects. <clears throat> and then, you know, we went our separate ways. I ended up going into the software industry, um, partially because we were having some supply chain issues even back then in 2012 with deliveries. Mm -hmm. And uh, I had a really hard time selling things that then I couldn't deliver. So I was spending a lot of time kind of firefighting, assisting my OEMs with completing their bombs when we had issues. And I thought to myself, hmm, software, at least if I sell it, it's already made, right? I <laughs> wonder if it can be made in the factory and shipped to my customer. Uh -huh. um, and I got this really opp wonderful opportunity to work in electromagnetic simulation. So virtual prototyping of devices. Oh, and cool. Yeah. Again, this whole upstream, downstream mentality of systems thinking, I was thinking, well, shoot, the earlier we can catch or prevent a problem in production, the better because mm -hmm. you're not having to ship out a pallet of bad product, or maybe you're designing an electronic device that needs to get EMC certified and things like that. You don't have to make a bunch of prototypes and trial and error. You can do it all online, you know, in a software and run optimizations and then know exactly where to place your things for the right performance. Um, so it was just really interesting to me to get to, you know, go on to the design side of manufacturing, mm -hmm. designing for manufacturability. Um, and then I got the bug to go into uh, AI, uh, data analytics, data science was starting to really become a big thing. Um, how do we take outside sources of data and marry that with the data that we have to get better mm -hmm. insights? And I ended up working for a uh, startup in supply chain space that was doing exactly that um, called Algo. They're out of uh, Troy, Michigan. But at the same time, Roman um, left Festo for Apple and started to run their iPhone operations, handling all the machines that build the iPhone in China. And we sort of kept in touch and, and he went to Stanford and came up with this idea of Copeam because he had always, you know, as in his life as an engineer and a machine builder, felt like it was ridiculous how long it would take to source the bill of materials for, for a machine. And to be able to get quotes and pricing and collaborate with his vendors, if we, you know, we're designing super advanced, amazing automation for the hardware we're building. And on the back end, we're exchanging a bunch of PDFs and emails and phone calls. Mm -hmm. You know, the whole process is just very antiquated. Yeah. Um, yeah. And he didn't see that getting any better from his time at a small machine builder to Festo, which is a global company, to Apple, which is an even bigger company. This problem remains the same, no matter how mm. big you are. Yeah. And so he went to Stanford and met his co-founder and CTO, Andrew, there, who is a brilliant software engineer um, who was building uh, collaboration tools and things like that for Venmo and Box. Um, and we stayed in touch throughout that whole time. And uh, timing was not right for me to come on board when they first sort of started it. But with COVID and everything, I was looking for a change after I had been up in Seattle for a while. I actually got out of the industry for a while after I had my daughter. Um, I, I flipped houses and invested in real estate for three years. Uh, like <laughs> well, a crazy of course person you did. decided to learn something <laughs> completely new from scratch. Uh -huh. um, but I was like, oh, I can work on my schedule with my kids doing that. And uh, in 20, uh, last year, I was looking at, you know, okay, I'm, I don't want to stay here with two kids and no family and, you know, being isolated from everybody. I need to, you know, get back to thinking about going back to Texas. And at that time, they were taking the company full time. You know, they left their jobs and uh, decided to really, you know, pull the trigger on this coping thing. And so it worked out really well that I was moving and they, you know, it's a remote first company. 
They didn't care where I was at. Mm -hmm. So I joined them to help build this thing. And uh, it's been it's been an amazing ride. We've really uh, been able to accomplish so much of of what our goals are uh, for the platform. But at the same time, like we're just getting started. So it, it is. We're, we're hiring right now. We're growing our team. We're building out um, the infrastructure, getting a bunch of distributors uh, on there and uh, helping out a bunch of folks that have had a really hard time with delivery times to yeah. build machines. Yeah. So that's kind of what we're doing. It's a mixture of a you know, startup job and us building an online platform and then just me being out there in the trenches finding components and parts and shipping them to people. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, I mean, you've had just an amazing education, especially in such a short period of time. I mean, you're a guru on such a broad swath of industrial automation and sensors and software and all this stuff. And, and of course, everyone out here in, in the, the industrial world is just besieged by, you know, this, this full court press of, oh, if you're not doing industry 4.0, if you're not doing, um, you know, digitalization, you're already behind. And yet, like I said, you know, there's so many people who have their heads down just trying to get through each and every day. If someone's not near as educated as you are on all this stuff and they want to get started, what kinds of things would you tell them to be thinking about? You know, one of my life mottos is the answer to everything is it depends. It depends on where you're at. And if you have like just you, you have a very old school manufacturing facility and you don't have any of the fancy things that people talk about, then you're in a different place than if you're maybe halfway through it, or you have a lot of new machinery and some old machinery that maybe don't talk to each other. It really depends on where you are in your journey. And in my opinion, and I took the same you know approach when we were at Algo talking about digital transformation of supply chain data and, and big data and all this stuff. Mm-hmm. Everybody came yep. to us going, I want AI and big data. Yeah, It's like, well, let's look at where you're at. And you know what? Maybe some really intelligent analysis with Excel sheets is where you want to start because it's very hard to see success and visualize that success and really get the success when you try to, you know, jump over a canyon all, all at once. Yeah. And so my approach to whether it's digital transformation or automation on the factory floor or really anything else is is take it step by step and yeah. look at where you're at and what sort of the next potential steps could be and make sure that you're tackling problems in a way that give you ROI of that one step at a time. Yeah. Because then even if the next step is a failure or goes in the wrong direction, you can always course correct and you haven't lost everything that you've worked for. Right. Because you go step by step, then you can be more adaptable. And as things change, um, you can, you know, sort of pivot your your strategy. Uh, I see it way too much of, you know, I'm going to try to do an entire digital transformation of my company in the next three years. And then by the time three years rolls around, it's either, you know, completely over budget and, and didn't get where it needs to go. And it takes another mm-hmm. three years or now, you know, maybe the business climate has changed or your company's priorities have changed. Or what I see a lot of is you didn't get buy-in from, the people that are actually going to be using the technology, which is Mm -hmm. your operators and your analysts or your, you know, whoever is doing the day-to-day work that you're supposedly transforming. um, If you don't concurrently work with everybody in the organization to make use of this technology, if you dump it on them when it's a success, you know, a couple of years later, it will fail from a implementation standpoint Mm -hmm. because your people weren't ready. Yeah. Um, And so it's just, I know it's not the best answer in like, yes, do this, but really just seek out the the subject matter experts and the vendors that understand your industry, where you're at, what you're doing. Um, It doesn't, I wouldn't say go with the fanciest name or somebody that has the best reputation on LinkedIn or, or something necessarily interview a few people that get what you're doing in your process, Mm -hmm. because there is no, you know, one fits all recipe for this success. And sometimes it's a matter of taking really small steps that can have uh, incremental impact. And yeah. it's not as sexy as, you know, going lights out factory 4.0. Right, right. But that's where real success in this kind of thing comes from, in, in my opinion, in my experience. 
Yeah, I, I love that answer for two reasons. One is I think there's so many people out there who are just overwhelmed by it all. They hear, you know, the the World Economic Forum lighthouse factories. Yeah, they're phenomenal, no doubt. But if you're in this tiny machine shop in, you know, Nebraska and you haven't automated much of anything in two decades and you're just starting out, are you going to go off and be doing, you know, robots and special no. integrated sensors and all that? No, start small. Um, the other thing too, and I love that you hit it, is that people piece. Yeah. Of, you know, who are you doing this for and are they bought in? Because if they're not, you're right. It's not going anywhere. Yeah, and I, I really feel like it's a... It's the narrative out there for people that aren't in the industry. It's this us against the machines, right? Yeah. You're hire a robot to replace this person. Right. And in reality, that is generally not how it happens. And right. when it happens successfully, that's definitely not how it happens. And it yeah. shouldn't. It yeah. should be. Let's bring in a robot to do a portion of this person's job that sucks. And yes. then let's upskill that person to work with the robot and give them more meaningful work. And it, I know it's kind of a tired thing that people say but it's reality it's it's, it's totally it's, reality it's absolutely possible to do it that way and you, you know my opinion it's just bad management to think that you're going to hush hush make these initiatives and then you know lay off some people or have a reduced headcount i mean i've seen it where these technologies do reduce headcount but the right way to approach it is to just do it through your normal attrition you don't have yep. to rehire every person that decides to leave or gets a better opportunity, um, it can be managed properly. Yeah. And when we used to do these tr digital transformations at Algo, uh, we were doing a lot of RPA, so robotic process automation, which is really the software version of yeah. robotics. Yeah. And we started to do these stakeholder workshops before we ever got started. We would get everybody whose job would be touched by the process into a room and we would talk about what is it? What does it mean? How does it impact you and your job? And how does it actually help you upskill so yeah. that, you know, you can add that to your resume <clears throat> and you can get a better, you know, position. You have advancement opportunities in this organization or another one. Right. And it, we were in an industry that was unfortunately, where a lot of the applications we tackled were de their declining categories. So they had yeah. to get more efficient. So in the end, a lot of them did end up reducing headcount, but not a single one of them actually just fired people. Yeah. People either uh, moved to other opportunities within the organization or they moved to other opportunities outside the organization. Right. Nobody was laid off. And yeah. the remaining people then on the team were so much more efficient. And then their morale was fantastic. Yeah. You know? I, I, I love that you hit on that whole thing about upskilling and um, working with the people. I was just last Friday uh, visiting my buddy Nick Aarons at uh, Aarons Co., who make, you know, snowblowers and lawnmowers up uh, in Brilliant, Wisconsin, outside Green Bay. Cool. And they've just revolutionized what they do um, with automation. And, and I've long had this theory about, hey, you know, if you automate things, if you make things... Um, more modern, um, not only are you going to get rid of, like you said, the jobs that suck, um, get rid of safety problems, um, yeah. make things more efficient, but you're also giving your people that opportunity and, and hadn't really had uh, a really good example from, you know, today in industry of where that's happening. So just to ask Nick, he was telling me about his automation. I said, okay, so as you do this, have you seen that your people who were previously doing these lower level jobs are able to upskill and do the higher level work that these things require? It's like, absolutely. Yeah. It just happens like that. No problem whatsoever. Yeah. So, I was, yeah. It's, I was uh, just talking to somebody yesterday that is in the uh, logistics and warehouse, you know, automation industry. Mm -hmm. yeah. And my brother-in-law works in a warehouse. And I will tell you, they celebrate every piece of technology that comes in that yep. makes the job easier. Not only yep. because who really wants to walk miles and lift boxes and do so at a pace where you're supposed to, you know, just keep, keep it going. Cause you got to right, shift stuff, right. right? Yeah. Putting that 100% on people and their bodies all day long is, is not enjoyable for anyone. Um, and at the same time, these are unfortunately, you know, lower level jobs that don't pay fantastic. Mm -hmm. And so 
the workforce that comes in, it is very difficult when you have no, you know, advancement opportunities and it's a difficult work environment. The pay is not great. Yeah. My brother-in-law is the type of person that sticks to a job and he likes to, you know, cause I've probably taught him well, look for opportunities to learn on every job. It's not just about the, the job you get paid for, but it's about what else can you learn? What, how can you upskill? So he's going through the entire warehouse and getting forklift certified and learning the inventory yeah. systems and everything else. But a lot of people show up for that job and they, in two days, they don't show up anymore. Right. Yep. And so he's having a really hard time because it's the, the load, the workload is crazy on and off when they don't have enough workers because people just quit or they just mm -hmm. show up and they don't like the job and they just don't come back. Mm -hmm. And and so for, you know, the people on the floor in these jobs, if they have more technology to work with that can make the jobs more enjoyable and for people that come in to see more of a path for advancement, I think that works in everybody's favor because yeah. turnover of your workforce is a huge cost that I think a lot of people don't consider because it's, right. made, it's on a different line item somewhere on the budget, right? Right. The hiring right. And, you know, up, yeah, all training that. and all. Yep. Training. Yeah. You want people that want to stick with you that also. Yeah. And then in the long run, you can pay them more because they stick yeah. around. You don't have to pay for the HR expenses of turnover and recruiting and all that stuff. Yep. Cool. Okay. So um, we mentioned your podcast. You're just getting started. Tell us about that. Yeah. So automation ladies, uh, man, I came back. I took a break from LinkedIn uh, while I was doing my real estate stuff. And <laughs> I came back uh, last year and I was just to my delightful surprise. There were a lot more people engaging in a lot more discussions and, you know, things like that in the industry, not just here's my latest product release or, you know, mm -hmm. here's my resume or we're hiring, which is kind of what I had usually seen before. And I noticed that there are great podcasts in our industry all of a sudden. Most of them are within like two years old, right? Manufacturing Hub and Manufacturing Happy Hour. And um, there are several others that are fantastic. But just like the majority of our industry, it's, it's voices of men that are uh, most oftentimes in, in, you know, the top positions, right? Interviews with well, CEOs and like stuff. Which like me <laughs> and they're valuable but like to a you know aspiring uh maintenance technician maybe listening to the ceo of of some cool successful company doesn't really connect with you yeah. right and yeah. and so for me i saw ali posting about her work on linkedin and i saw megan interviewing women on on mavis of manufacturing yeah. and I just, it just resonated with me in a way that I didn't realize I was missing before. Um, that sense of community and camaraderie with, with other women that, you know, I relate to that do similar things that I do. Yeah. And so we were kind of, you know, talking to each other in some private chats and things like that. We started to Courtney Fernandez, who's an applications engineer at U, uh, uh, Universal Robots. She started a little Zoom meeting on Saturdays for us women with kids that like, <laughs> like to mess with robots. Uh -huh. um, and that was just really cool. And I was just thinking like, I, there's so many more women out there and people that like may want to connect with this type of message or this type of discussion. It's very informal. Like we all have lives and kids and things going on, but we're mm -hmm. just super into robots. And mm -hmm. maybe most of the people in our physical, normal life, like don't really care about robots like we do. <laughs> and that's where I thought to myself, like I'd always kind of wanted to do some sort of podcast. Um, but never got it going for one reason or another. And I think sometimes you just need the right partner too, to push you or, yeah. you know, to, to fill in the other half of, of what you need. And I just one day in a crazy thought messaged Ali and it was like, Hey, I know you don't really know me, but I want to start a podcast. Do you want to do it with me? <laughs> and she was oh, like, that's awesome. Yeah. And I had been listening to this podcast that somebody recommended to me on LinkedIn called office ladies. And uh, it's about the show, The Office. Are you familiar oh, okay. with it? Yeah. yeah. So TV show, The Office, there's two women from um, Pam and Angela. Mm -hmm. They're actually best friends in real life. They started a podcast called Office Ladies, where they just talk about, eat, on every episode, they talk about one episode of The Office and like <laughs> how they experienced it, what happened behind the scenes, what their thoughts about it. They just chat and reminisce and answer questions from people. And it I was just like, why don't we just do something like that about automation? So that's where the name Automation Ladies came from. The idea of us kind of chatting and 
I don't know. I guess I just manifested this, but Allie and I are pretty much best friends now. So cool. It's been pretty cool. That's awesome. Good deal. Well, so what's next for you on the whole uh just general automation and, and industry advocacy and everything, all the craziness in your life. What what's in the future for you? Well, I'm trying not to travel too much right now because of my kids being so yeah. little, but I really do enjoy going to in-person events, conferences, um, speaking actually. I had I had a lot of fun speaking at AI conferences back before I had my daughter. Um, that's a story for another day, but my water broke actually at an AI conference <laughs> in the Bay Area. Oh, uh, <laughs> yeah, I guess so, you were enjoying it. <laughs> wow. I like to speak on panels and, and you know, things like that. So I've started to do a little bit more of that. Um, yep. I just submitted a speaker abstract for a cybersecurity conference here in Houston. So again, not trying to travel too much. Mm -hmm. uh, with an expert in cybersecurity, my expertise is a little bit more on the supply chain. So we're going to be talking about cybersecurity in the supply chain together. Oh, nice. um, yep. I'm also going to be attending IMTS in Chicago next month. Uh, we're not exhibiting there, but you mentioned Andrew Crow earlier. Mm -hmm. He is also a fantastic champion and amazing person. And I've been waiting to meet him in person and he's going to be at IMTS. Yep. Megan Zimba of Mavens of Manufacturing is going to be interviewing me um, at the show. And so I, I had to show up at least. And I'm hoping we're trying to get Allie to come to if she if her workload with her clients isn't too crazy. Her business is growing like nothing else as well. Um, yep. So we're hoping so I think, to there. I think I'm going to be there at least one day. Ooh, well, we should definitely meet up. I'll, I'll um, let you know. We're definitely going to be at Automate again next year in Detroit. That was that was a, a an amazing experience, and yep. I really want to start going out there. So I spend a lot of time behind my computer sourcing parts, uh, yeah. which yeah. is which is great. But you know, I get bored, and it's also nice to get out sometimes and meet people. So I'm yeah. going to start doing um, some more local factory tours here in Houston because I also want to you know get a little bit more of a local network going. I just moved back here. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I know a lot of people on the internet in a lot of different places, but I don't have a huge manufacturing community here in Houston. So if you're listening to this and you're in Houston, pre please reach out to me. Um, I'm planning to do a uh, warehouse factory tour soon, looking at some some warehouse robotics. Um, probably going to try to do a tour. My sister-in-law runs an awesome screen printing company um, and an e they do e-commerce fulfillment as well. So they have a warehouse component to it. And I would love to tell their story because they started out as a manual press uh, screen printing shop out of a storage unit. Oh, wow. <laughs> and now they have multiple, uh, they have a warehouse, they have a huge, you know, operation with a lot more automation um, and they're just killing it. So I want to just get out there in my local community, um, see more, you know, factory floors and yeah. keep doing what we're doing and helping end users, systems integrators, panel builders and OEMs. Um, get the parts they need to keep our automation, you know, uh, adventure moving forward, because that's one of the struggles right now. There's so much more investment yeah. in automation, yeah. but we're having a really hard time fulfilling all the orders and getting all the machines out the door. Yep, definitely. Is there anything we haven't hit on that people ought to know about you? Oh. Covered a lot of ground. <laughs> oh, okay. Some people think I changed jobs last, last week. Um, I will say, you know, oh. read read the full post on LinkedIn before you make an assumption like that. Uh, yep. But I did post a new gig. So because yep. I'm a crazy person, um, <laughs> I have been in and out of the, the venture capital community. Having been in, in San Francisco, I worked with startups. You know, we've raised money at Copeam. So I, I know some of that world. And it has a lot of the same issues as our manufacturing uh, community does in terms of diversity. And so I recently became a deal partner at Ghana's Ventures, uh, which is a woman owned uh, run venture capital firm that is investing in pre-seed and seed stage uh, community led companies and primarily focusing on uh, funding underrepresented founders. So women and people of color and people that traditionally don't have, you know, great access or networks for this venture capital. It's not specifically to robotics or manufacturing companies. Um, but obviously that's where a big part of my network is. Sure. So shout out to any founders out there building companies where you consider your customers to be your community and, you know, you're looking to change the world. Uh, I want to connect you to Ghana's ventures and hopefully get you some funding. So that's, that's something new on my uh, roster that I'm super excited about. Just to fill up that spare time. Right. <laughs> Good deal. Well, Nikki, it has been an absolute pleasure talking to you. I wish you all the best with all your 
many pursuits. And yeah, hopefully we'll see each other in person for the first time there in Chicago here in just a few weeks. Yeah, sounds good. I'm looking forward to it, Jim. All right. Yeah, thanks for being on. Have a great weekend. You too. Take care. Bye. Thanks for tuning in to Manufacturing Talks with Jim Vanosky. Watch for new episodes dropping on the first and third Tuesdays of every month. 